Okay, well, thanks for sitting down with us. You had a big crowd today at uh, the Frontier Center luncheon. Uh, you said that you're a prairie guy at heart. Nice to be back here. You see big, uh, big gains to be made on the prairies. Absolutely. It's the prairie common sense values that raised me. Uh, you know, as I said in my speech, um, I was born of a 16-year-old unwed mother who couldn't raise me, so she put me up for adoption to two uh, school teachers, and they always taught me that it didn't matter where I came from, but where I was going, and uh, that's the country I want for my kids. Uh, but uh, it's not the country people feel with right now. People feel trapped. It doesn't matter how hard they work. Their paychecks get chewed up by Trudeau's high taxes or the inflation that he's caused, or the fact they can't afford a home after seven years of Trudeau in power. So I want to get, turn that hurt into hope, and I believe uh, that message of hope will resonate across the prairies where I come from. You know, you talked about the cost of living. Uh, people are just being crushed by this. Yeah. It doesn't seem to matter where you are in this country. People are feeling it. What would you, I mean, if you're the prime minister, what would you, could you have avoided this? Or what would you be doing uh, if you couldn't avoid it? You're in the, this position right now. How do you get out of it? What do you, what do, you do to offer relief other than, you know, government, throwing government money at people, which you've said that you wouldn't, you don't think it's, that's the answer, right? Well, the Trudeau government's causing the inflation, the half trillion dollars of inflationary deficits have bid up the goods we buy and the interest we pay, throwing money away on CERB payments for prisoners and for uh, p dead people and giving uh, seven billion more in, un in contracts to high priced consultants. All that waste is making life more expensive. So I'd get rid cut the waste, cap the spending, and get rid of the liberal NDP carbon tax. And that's the big disagreement now. Of course, the Liberals and NDP want to triple, triple, triple the carbon tax on your heat, your gas, your groceries. That's going to crush families. I won't allow it. I'm going to get rid of the carbon tax and fight climate change with technology, not taxes. What sort of technology? What are you thinking would be the answer to? I mean, obviously, we, we have a climate crisis. I think everybody kind of agrees with that now. What's the technological escape from that if it's not uh, the carbon tax? Well, instead of making traditional energy more expensive, we have to make carbon-free alternatives more affordable. So uh, quickly approve more hydroelectric dams to produce emissions-free electricity, approve nuclear power so that we can replace coal fire plants, uh, allow the oil and gas sector to invest in carbon capture, to capture the carbon in the ground rather than putting it into the air, uh, and to produce the metals of electrification here in Canada, produce them, the lithium, the cobalt, the graphite for electric car batteries in Canada, uh, powered by hydro, so that uh, we have electric cars that are made in an environmentally friendly way. Um, that's how we're going to make it possible for people to make the switch without driving our working class into miserable poverty, which is what the NDP Liberal Costly Coalition is doing now. Uh, you mentioned the hydro. I mean, lots of First Nations communities um, have been devastated by hydro development in their areas. So there's that. But then also, you know, nuclear power. Um, are you worried at all? There's not, nobody even has anything to do with the nuclear waste yet. So should we be producing more power uh, when we haven't figured out what to do with the waste? Is that smart? Well, um, Ontario gets half of its energy from nuclear right now. And we have safe disposal of it. There is, then this is something we have to be very clear about. There is no carbon-free future without nuclear power. That's just a physical and mathematical fact. Um, and because there's no other source that can meet the needs of our civilization. So we have to use clean, safe nuclear power, the way Ontario has been doing, the way France has been doing for decades now. Uh, and we can do it, we have to do it. Uh, and that's the way we're gonna redu reduce the emissions from our electrical sector. But where do you put the waste, though? It's stored right now. There's not really, a, my understanding is that there's not really an end uh, in sight for like what you do with that stored waste. You can't really store it forever, right? Yeah, you, so store, you, can, you, you can store waste and you also, there are new technological um, um, advancements that leave less waste behind. We need to, there's recent bra breakthroughs in nuclear fusion. There's small modular reactors. Uh, these breakthroughs will be absolutely necessary uh, because the only way to power our future um, is through hydroelectricity and nuclear power. The other sources, solar and wind, they're fine, but they don't have, uh, they can't they don't have the capacity and they're variable. They only, they only power us when the wind blows and the sun shines. We need baseload power and that has to come from hydro and nuclear. 
Um, I want to switch gears to air travel. I know you, I think everybody, I understand you guys even had your own little bit of hassles with traveling the other day. Yeah. Um, you've, you've said, you know, government should be less intrusive in our lives, less regulation. Um, I feel like, but you said that the, this government should have done more with the air travel nightmares that we've had. What, I guess, would you have done uh, in similar circumstance if you were the, uh, the prime minister? Well, first of all, I, I want to promote more competition in our airline sector. We have very little competition, and that's why uh, the airlines think they can get away with mistreating us. Um, airlines are federal responsibility. They're federally regulated. Uh, airports are federally mandated. And under Justin Trudeau, our airlines and our airports have been a disaster, an absolute disaster. And we had winter before Justin Trudeau. We didn't have airline catastrophe like we have now. His total incompetence in managing federal responsibilities, whether it's airports, airlines, passports, immigration backlogs, his total incompetence is harming the lives of everyday people as we've seen with the catastrophic air service we had. There are 30,000 federal complaints by Canadians against the airlines to Justin Trudeau's transportation agency that are in a backlog. They have to wait 18 months for Trudeau's government to rule on those complaints. No wonder the airlines aren't worried. Uh, and meanwhile, the Trudeau government gets no fines out of those uh, companies for having uh, broken their commitments to their uh, customers. And countries around the world have much better, faster, and more affordable airline service than we do in Trudeau's Canada. What would you want to see him do right now to kind of right that wrong, or to fix it to it so at least it doesn't happen again? I mean, well, for obviously. He's got a, Trudeau's got to clear his backlog of 30,000 complaints. How do you do that? Well, get, get your bureaucracy working. <laughs> he has more bureaucrats working, more bureaucrats getting paid right now, 30,000 more, and yet we can't get passports, can't process airline complaints, can't process immigration. So it's his personal incompetence that means that we're paying more for less. We need a competent prime minister with a, a bureaucracy that actually gets things done to serve the people. Would you cut the bureaucracy or you think they just should be working smarter? I think we can get more productivity uh, out of our government right now. You know, he's spending 70% more on high price consultants. That adds up to $7 billion. The total budget for high price consultants today, $17 billion. That works out to more than $1,000 for every family in Canada. Think about that for a second. Your family is spending $1,000 in federal taxes for Justin Trudeau's high price consultants. That's an abject waste of money, and so is his government. Um, let's move on to reconciliation then. So uh, I know that had been a big campaign promise of this government. You know, we want to move forward on reconciliation. You've got the truth and reconciliation calls to action. Um, there's that's not moving super quickly. We've got UNDRIP not moving super quickly. Would there be a change, a shift in direction under uh, a Pierre Polyev government in terms of where Canada goes down the reconciliation path? Yes, I mean, with Trudeau, it's been a lot of symbolism uh, and uh, speeches and drama, uh, but no results. Uh, so I would take a different approach. One, we need to get clean drinking water on every reserve in every community. And I would uh, contract uh, the infrastructure companies and I would say to them, they don't get paid until the water, the clean water is available and some of their pay will be contingent on those clean water systems continuing to work for years to come. So they can't build a faulty system, get paid and buzz off. They have to get the job done to serve because our First Nations people deserve clean drinking water. Point number two, the Indian Act is a disaster. It is a racist colonial uh, hangover that gives all the control to self-serving and incompetent politicians, bureaucrats and lobbyists in Ottawa and takes away the control from the First Nations themselves. I want to make it easier for First Nations that want to opt out of the Indian Act to do so, so that they can control their own money, their own land, their own resources, and their own decisions. Uh, I believe First Nations know what's good for them, and the problem in this country has been a top-down colonial government in Ottawa that has imposed its will against the will of the First Nations people. And finally, I'm going to make it possible for those First Nations who choose to develop their resources and commerce in their communities to keep the money, rather than having it go to Ottawa 
and then the, then the people have to go and ask the bureaucrats for their own money back. I want to create a new model that will allow First Nations to keep their money and benefit their people so that they can fulfill their purpose and their destiny. Uh, and that, that's, uh, that's my vision. There's been, uh, and I'm not sure if there's something you would know about, but um, there has been some people who have talked about status Indians being able to sign off on their status, just be, you know, be essentially landlords of the land. Here I get my, my status card back and you, as living on this land, would pay me sort of almost a rent. I'm not sure if this is a concept that you've been familiar with. Sheila North had worked on it a little bit. Uh, it was kind of, kind of hatched here in Winnipeg. But that idea of, uh, you know, it's just kind of another step away from that Indian Act uh, mentality of how Canada and Indigenous people have been forced to, or First Nations people have been forced to, to live here. Uh, is that something you would think about? Well, I know there have been a lot of very successful First Nations who do uh, have lease arrangements. So, you know, for example, the Penticton Band um, has developed wineries and real estate and other commerce with the goal of getting $10 million of um, revenue per year for their local services. Um, and um, the uh, Soyuz Band, the um, First Nations uh, in uh, all across British Columbia, actually. Those are in prime real estate. Yeah. It's a little different if you're living in Garden Hill, right? To yeah, maximizing your your resources uh, in some of these communities, certainly. But I was more talking specifically about individuals can say, you know, you pay me twenty five thousand dollars a year. Pick it. Pick that, I'm just throwing that number out there. I don't have um, a status card. I'm not tax exempt now. Like you're sell, you're you're trading in that status card. Um, and I had heard that, you know, that's something that perhaps uh, conservatives would, would be hoping to advance. I'm not familiar I'm not with that particular proposal, like that. but um, yeah, I, so I can't comment on it. Okay. Uh, what about, and uh, this speaks to the, we just had headlines yesterday about the graves, more graves potentially. Uh, these would be across the former residential school sites in Canada. We know this. This was laid out in the 2015 uh, TRC Commission. Um, this is going to be a years-long process of First Nations people, communities looking for these graves. Is that something, you know, I know this government has said we support it, whatever it is, you know, we fund it. Is that the tack that you would take as well? We, we would fully fund all the inquiries into uh, the uh, human remains at the or near the sites of residential schools. Uh, and my last question, I guess, would be for you. Uh, Winnipeg, looking at Manitoba for the next election, um, you think you guys are going to regain a big stronghold on that, on this area? Look, uh, uh, people are suffering in Winnipeg under Justin Trudeau. They can't afford, the young people can't afford homes. Single moms are putting water in their milk because they can't afford groceries for their kids. Uh, we have homelessness and drug overdoses, and cr violent crime is up 32% under Justin Trudeau's policies. Uh, people want a change in Winnipeg that will uh, give them back control of their paycheck through lower taxes and less inflation, that will put violent repeat habitual offenders behind bars while respecting law-abiding hunters and anglers. And uh, that's the change that I'm going to bring. I'm going to put, uh, give Winnipegers control of their own lives, their paychecks and their futures. And that's why I believe I will win in Winnipeg and across Manitoba. I know I said that was my last question, but I have one more because you brought up crime, and that's a very good one, especially here in Winnipeg. Um, what is the solution to rising crime? I mean, we've got drug problems, we've got mental health that's not being addressed. I know you had mentioned, you know, the, the, the BC model didn't appeal to you as much as the Alberta model. Yeah. Is there a Manitoba model, or is there uh, a one-size-fits-all? Well, recovery and treatment for a drug-free life, that's the future. Um, right now, uh, people can't get recovery. There aren't beds available. And uh, while Justin Trudeau wastes billions of dollars buying back hunting rifles uh, and taking away the hunting rights of First Nations people, um, uh, supposedly he thinks this is going to help fight crime, I put those resources into reinforcing our borders against drugs and, and gun smugglers and on recovery and treatment for uh, drug addicts. Um, we know it's possible. I, I met a lady just in Timmins just yesterday, a waitress who had been a nurse, got addicted to opioids because, of course, the lying um, dirtbag uh, pharmaceutical companies told her that it was safe. She got addicted, she lost her kids, but guess what? She got into a recovery program and she turned her life around. And now she's working, she has an income, she's a responsible member of our community. It proves that no matter how 
far lost people feel like they are. There is hope to turn it around. We need to get them the recovery and treatment to make that possible. You'd give the provinces that money for that, like I guess, in increased healthcare spending. Would you do it with no strings like they're asking? Because then they could use it for exactly these types of programs that you're talking I'll about. I'll have a very clear recovery and treatment um, proposal coming and it will get results. Uh, we're not just going to throw money around. I want beds, I want counselors, detox, medication that will help with withdrawal and overdoses. They're all going to be part of my plan. And we will get, we will rescue the lives of our friends, our neighbors, our brothers and sisters who, who have fallen victim to this uh, horrific addiction crisis. We will get them back, we will save their lives and we'll put them back in control of their lives. Well, we thank you for taking the time to sit down with us today. Thank it's you. Been a pleasure. Covered lots of ground there. Yes, great to be with you and uh, wonderful to be back on the prairies.